Well, hi again, everyone. Jim Tarbox here from the virtual Owen McKiernan Library at the Celtic Junction. Today we're going to do a third Irish fairy tale by Edmund Leamy. We're going to do this in halves so it doesn't get too long, and uh, we hope you'll spark your interest in coming back to hear how the story ends. But let's get started with a tale called The Little White Cat. A long, long time ago, in a valley far away, the giant Trencoss lived in a great castle, surrounded by trees that were always green. The castle had a hundred doors, and every door was guarded by a huge shaggy hound with tongue of fire and claws of iron, who tore to pieces anyone who went to the castle without the giant's leave. Trencoss had made war on the king of the torrents, and having killed the king and slain his people, and burned his palace, he carried off his only daughter, Princess Eileen, to the castle in the valley. Here he provided her with beautiful rooms and appointed a hundred dwarves dressed in blue and yellow satin to wait upon her and harpers to play sweet music for her. And he gave her diamonds without number, brighter than the sun, but he would not allow her to go outside the castle and told her if she went one step beyond its doors, the hounds with tongues of fire and claws of iron would tear her to pieces. A week after her arrival, war broke out between the giant and the king of the islands, and before he set out for battle, the giant sent for the princess and informed her that on his return, he would make her his wife. When the princess heard this, she began to cry, for she would rather die and marry the giant who had slain her father. Crying will only spoil your bright eyes, my little princess, said Trencas, and you will have to marry me whether you like it or no. He then bade her go back to her room, and he ordered the dwarves to give her everything she asked for while he was away, and the harpers to play the sweetest music for her. When the princess gained her room, she cried as if her heart would break. The long day passed slowly, and the night came, but brought no sleep to Eileen. And in the gray light of the morning, she rose and opened the window and looked about in every direction to see if there were any chance of escape. But the window was ever so high above the ground, and below were the hungry and ever watchful hounds. With a heavy heart, she was about to close the window when she thought she saw the branches of the tree that was nearest to it moving. She looked again, and she saw a little white cat creeping along one of the branches. Mew, cried the cat. Poor little pussy, said the princess. Come to me, pussy. Stand back from the window, said the cat, and I will. The princess stepped back, and the little white cat jumped into the room. The princess took the little cat on her lap and stroked him with her hand, and the cat raised its back and began to purr. "'Where do you come from, and what is your name?' asked the princess. "'No matter where I come from or what's my name,' said the cat. "'I am a friend of yours, and I come to help you.' "'I never wanted help worse.' said the princess. I know that, said the cat. And now listen to me. When the giant comes back from battle and asks you to marry him, say to him, you will marry him. But I will never marry him, said the princess. Do what I tell you, said the cat. When he asks you to marry him, say to him, you will, if his dwarfs will wind for you three balls from the fairy dew that lies on the bushes on a misty morning as big as these, said the cat, putting his right forefoot into his ear and taking out three balls, one yellow, one red, and one blue. They are very small, said the princess. They are not much bigger than peas, and the dwarves will not be long at their work. Won't they, said the cat. It will take them a month and a day to make one, so that it will take three months and three days before the balls are wound. But the giant, like you, will think they can be made in a few days, and so he will readily promise to do what you ask. He will soon find out his mistake, 
but he will keep his word and will not press you to marry him until the balls are wound. When will the giant come back? asked Eileen. He will return tomorrow afternoon, said the cat. Will you stay with me until then, said the princess. I am very lonely. I cannot stay, said the cat. I have to go away to my palace on the island on which no man ever placed his foot and where no man but one shall ever come. And where is that island? asked the princess. And who is the man? The island is in the far-off seas where a vessel never sailed. The man you will see before many days are over, and if all goes well, he will one day slay the giant Trenkos and free you from his power. Ah, sighed the princess, that can never be, for no weapon can wound the hundred hounds that guard the castle, and no sword can kill the giant Trenkos. There is a sword that will kill him, said the cat, but I must go now. Remember what you are to say to the giant when he comes home, and every morning watch the tree on which you saw me, and if you see in the branches anyone you like better than yourself, said the cat, winking at the princess, throw him these three balls and leave the rest to me. But take care not to speak a single word to him, for if you do, all will be lost. Shall I ever see you again? asked the princess. Time will tell, answered the cat. And without saying so much as goodbye, he jumped through the window onto the tree, and in a second was out of sight. The morrow afternoon came, and the giant Trenkos returned from battle. Eileen knew of his coming by the furious barking of the hounds, and her heart sank, for she knew that in a few moments she would be summoned to his presence. Indeed, he had hardly entered the castle when he sent for her and told her to get ready for the wedding. The princess tried to look cheerful as she answered, I will be ready as soon as you wish, but you must first promise me something. Ask anything you like, little princess, said Trencross. Well then, said Eileen, before I marry you, you must make your dwarves wind three balls as big as these from the fairy dew that lies on the bushes on a misty morning in summer. Is that all? said Trenkos, laughing. I shall give the dwarves orders at once, and by this time tomorrow the balls will be wound, and our wedding can take place in the evening. And you will leave me to myself until then? I will, said Trenkos. On your honor as a giant, said Eileen. On my honor as a giant replied Trenkos. The princess returned to her rooms. Then the giant summoned all his dwarves, and he ordered them to go forth in the dawning of the morn and to gather all the fairy dew lying on the bushes and to wind three balls, one yellow, one red, and one blue. The next morning, and the next, and the next, the dwarves went out into the fields and searched all the hedgerows but they could gather only as much fairy dew as would make a thread as long as a wee girl's eyelash. And so they had to go out morning after morning, and the giant fumed and threatened, but all to no purpose. He was very angry with the princess, and he was vexed with himself that she was so much cleverer than he was, and moreover, he saw now that the wedding could not take place as soon as he expected. When the little white cat went away from the castle, he ran as fast as he could, up hill and down dale, and never stopped until he came to the Prince of the Silver River. The prince was alone, and very sad and sorrowful he was, for he was thinking of the Princess Eileen, and wondering where she could be. Mew, said the cat, as he sprang softly into the room, but the prince did not heed him. Mew, Again, said the cat, but again the prince did not heed him. Mew, said the cat the third time, and he jumped up on the prince's knee. Where do you come from and what do you want? asked the prince. I come from where you would like to be, said the cat. And where is that? said the prince. 
Oh, where is that indeed? As if I didn't know what you were thinking of, and of whom you were thinking, said the cat, and it would be far better for you to try and save her. I would give my life a thousand times over for her, said the prince. For whom? said the cat with a wink. I named no name, your highness, said he. You know very well who she is, said the prince, if you know what I was thinking of. But do you know where she is? She is in danger, said the cat. She is in the castle of the giant Trenkas in the valley beyond the mountains. I will set out there at once, said the prince, and I will challenge the giant to battle and will slay him. Easier said than done, said the cat. There is no sword made by the hands of man can kill him. And even if you could kill him, his hundred hounds, with tongues of fire and claws of iron, would tear you to pieces. Then what am I to do? asked the prince. Be said by me, said the cat. Go to the wood that surrounds the giant's castle and climb the high tree that's nearest to the window that looks toward the sunset and shake the branches, and you will see what you will see. Then hold out your hat with the silver plumes and three balls. One yellow, one red, and one blue will be thrown into it. And then come back here as fast as you can, but speak no word, for if you utter a single word, the hounds will hear you, and you shall be torn to pieces. Well, the prince set off at once, and after two days' journey, he came to the wood round the castle, and he climbed the tree that was nearest the window that looked towards the sunset, and he shook the branches. As soon as he did so, the window opened, and he saw the princess Eileen, looking lovelier than ever. He was going to call out her name, but she placed her fingers on her lips, and he remembered what the cat had told him but he was to speak no word. In silence, he held out the hat with the silver plumes, and the princess threw into it the three balls, one after another. And blowing him a kiss, she shut the window. And well it was she did so, for at that very moment she heard the voice of the giant, who was coming back from hunting. The prince waited until the giant had entered the castle before he descended the tree. He set off as fast as he could. He went uphill and down dale, and never stopped until he arrived at his own palace. And there waiting for him was the little white cat. Have you brought the three balls? said he. I have, said the prince. Then follow me, said the cat. On they went until they left the palace far behind and came to the edge of the sea. Now, said the cat. Unravel a thread of the red ball. Hold the thread in your right hand. Drop the ball into the water, and you shall see what you shall see. The prince did as he was told, and the ball floated out to sea, unraveling as it went, and it went on until it was out of sight. Pull now, said the cat. The prince pulled, and as he did, he saw far away something on the sea shining like silver. It came nearer and nearer, and he saw it was a little silver boat. At last it touched the sand. Now, said the cat, step into this boat, and it will bear you to the palace on the island on which no man has ever placed his foot, the island in the unknown seas that were never sailed by vessels made of human hands. In that palace, there is a sword with a diamond hilt, and by that sword alone the giant Trenkos can be killed. There also are a hundred cakes, and it is only on eating these hundred hounds can die. But mind what I say to you, if you eat or drink until you reach the palace of the little cat in the island, in the unknown seas, you will forget the Princess Eileen. I will forget myself first, said the princess, said the prince, as he stepped into the silver boat, which floated away so quickly that it was soon out of sight of land. The day passed, and the night fell, and the stars shone down upon the waters, 
but the boat never stopped. On she went for two whole days and nights. And on the third morning, the prince saw an island in the distance. And very glad he was, for he thought it was his journey's end. And he was almost fainting with thirst and hunger. But the day passed, and the island was still before him. Well, that's the end of part one of The Little White Cat. We'll continue with part two next time. This is Jim Tarbox from the U. Owen McEwen Library at Celtic Junction. We'll see you then. <laughs>